بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم مساكم الله بالخير جميعا وشكرا الحقيقة على تخصيص جزء من وقتكم وال... والاستجابة للدعوة اللي قدمناها لكم ال... الأخوة والأخوات الحضور السادة الضيوف السلام عليكم ورحمة الله يطيب لي أن أرحب بكم في غرفة الرياض وفي هذا اللقاء الذي تنظمه لجنة الاستثمار أوراق المالية لتسليط الضوء على التجارب العالمية الناجحة في الأسواق المالية بهدف رفع المستوى الوعي لدى المستثمرين وكافة أفراد المجتمع وتعريفهم بأهمية الوسائل المثلى للاستثمار الآمن في هذه الأسواق الجمع الكريم إن هذا اللقاء يكتسب أهميته من حيث مواكبته لما تشهده المملكة من تحولات اقتصادية هامة برزت ملامحها في رؤية 2030 والتركيز على تحفيل الاستثمار وتهيئة الظروف الملائمة له ولا شك أن السوق المالية تقع في قلب هذه الرؤية ولهذا كان لابد من دعمها وتطوير وتطويرها بما يتماشى مع هذه الرؤية الطموحة الأخوات والأخوة الحضور وانطلاقا من الدورة التي تطلع بها الغرفة ممثلة في لجنة الاستثمار الأوراق المالية في هذا الجانب فقد حرصنا على تنظيم هذا اللقاء والذي سيتحدث فيه نخبة من الخبراء العالميين والمحليين في مجال الأسواق المالية وهم الأستاذ خلود بنت عبد العزيز التخيل عضو لجنة الاستثمار الأوراق المالية والدكتور روبرت بارنز الرئيس العالمي للأسواق المال الأولية في بورصة لندن والسيد جوكل ماني رئيس الأسواق الأولية في الشرق الأوسط وأفريقيا والهند حيث سيتطرقون لعدد من الموضوعات والمحاور المهمة حول واقع أسواق المال العالمية وفي الختام أكرر ترحيبي بكم جميعا آملا أن نوفق فيما نصب إليه من أهداف والله من وراء القصد وهو المستعان والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Shukran, Sadh Muhammad. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure today to assist in moderating the discussion. We at the Investment and Securities Committee at the Riyadh Chamber are honored uh, to have our distinguished guest all, all the way from the London Stock Exchange. Uh, the economic relationship between the United between Saudi Arabia and the United Kingdom has always been strong and continues to be so. Allah ta'amil ma'roof. Uh, with the Kingdom being UK's largest trading partner in the Middle East. The UK has also made clear that it wants to be a strategic partner. So the UK has also made it clear that it wants to be a strategic partner in Saudi Arabia's Vision 2030 implementation. Over 6,000 UK firms actively engage and export goods to Saudi Arabia. The UK exports, exported 7.3 billion pounds in goods and services. The, United, the, the UK is Saudi Arabia's second largest cumulative investor with approximately 200 joint ventures, which are estimated to be worth around 11.5 billion pounds. And now, without further ado, please allow me to introduce our dear guests. First, we have Dr. Robert Barnes, um, who is the global head of primary markets at London Stock Exchange Group and the CEO of Turquoise, which is the European multilateral trading facility, majority owned by LSEG. Prior to joining Turquoise LSEG in 2013, Dr. Robert worked at UBS for more than 19 years, including the managing director, equities, and founding CEO of UBS. His industry roles included serving as a chairman of the Securities Trading Committee of the London Investment Banking Association. Dr. Robert holds a BA from Harvard, a PhD from Cambridge, and is a Chartered Fellow of the Chartered Institute for Securities and Investment. We also have Mr. Gokul Mani, who is Head of Primary Markets, Middle East, Africa, and India for London Stock Exchange, and is responsible for the firm's listing business across product classes in these markets. Mr. Gokul joined London Stock Exchange in 2017, having spent a prior 16 years across investment banking and capital markets. He was at Bank America, Merrill Lynch, and Awad Capital. Prior to that, he had led equity market issuance in excess of 40 billion US dollars and has advised on several global M&A and debt capital market transactions. He led the IPO of Amar Malls uh, at 1.6 billion US dollars and Gulf Marine Services, $320 million, among other debt capital market and M&A transactions. Uh, across um, and over uh, 20 IPOs and equity issuance across uh, London Stock Exchange, New York Stock Exchange, 
Euronex and Milan over his years in London. Mr. Manny holds an advanced management program, a degree from Harvard, an investment banking institute diploma from Wharton School, uh, UPenn, and a Bachelor's of Science in Economics from London School of Economics. Gentlemen, welcome to Saudi Arabia. So to start the discussion, uh, I would like to say first that London Stock Exchange and London Stock Exchange Group is a huge organization that has a massive outreach and various arms. This includes access to different capital markets, different information services, trading platforms, trading technologies. Um, Dr. Barnes, can you tell us please uh, and elaborate on the business model of London Stock Exchange? Well, thank you very much. <coughs> and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we would like to thank Mr. President and Ms. Clude for inviting us as humble practitioners to address such a distinguished audience. So ladies and gentlemen, London Stock Exchange Group and all of us in this room, we gather as a community because we share vision and the values of integrity, innovation, partnership excellence as we try to promote the best results on a continuous basis for our investors. In fact, the very definition of best practice. And innovation is much more than just generating ideas. It's about execution and implementation of these ideas. And London Stock Exchange Group as a humble market operator has established a track record of a positive customer engagement and inclusive of innovation involving investors and issuers. <clears throat> and I think if I might just do a little preamble as to why we are here today and then explain about the group. We're very privileged a month ago to join the Right Honorable the Lord Mayor on his very first international visit was here in the kingdom. And for us in the city of London that is a big signal at this time of macroeconomic change and particularly big dynamic change in the regulation that we face in Europe, the UK and worldwide. When we take a look at what has happened in the UK, one of the reasons we came in December was to share some insights around privatization, particularly as the kingdom has been articulate about a potential privatization program, and we did some workshops sharing some insights not just from the privatizations from the early 1980s but as recent as Royal Mail here in 2013 and <clears throat> allow us also as humble students of the market to share with you what we understand as we've been listening to the vision 2030 we know the macro themes about the kingdom being the heart of the islamic world and bridging east and west and participating amongst the big investors worldwide and we recognize the pillars as you're doing this remarkable change of a dynamic society economic diversification and particularly foreign direct investment so we often recognize a company that sets up a factory or a business locally that's foreign direct investment angel investors from another country that will invest directly into a company in the kingdom is foreign direct investment but we also see the opportunity of a company here in the kingdom that comes and joins the international community in London for capital raising is also bringing foreign direct investment here into the kingdom <clears throat> and the vision 2030 is particularly relevant worldwide when we recognize that there are more than 80 80 active international financial center projects and when we consider what are the ingredients for a successful financial center there are broadly four one the capital markets at which the stock exchange is the heart legal and dispute resolution as a country and a financial center grows that needs to be efficient three infrastructure and financing at a time when real assets really matter and of course education skills and promotion and here it's been our great privilege to have enjoyed the very warm hospitality that you've welcomed to us and i hope after our presentation today uh, you also look forward as much as we do to continuing our cooperation in the kingdom so when we talk about london stock exchange group it's really evolved from what was a select gathering in the coffee houses many hundreds of years ago to what has now become a global infrastructure provider 
that broadly provides three types of services. So the capital markets and capital raising, like the primary markets we expect. We have a risk management platform, which is uh, particularly in our London Clearinghouse, which is the largest risk manager of interest rate swaps, measuring on notional well over, say, 800 trillion. Uh, that is all over the world, whether that's in US dollar swaps, Hong Kong dollar swaps. Most of that activity is concentrated in one place. Why? Because it provides the regulators a more accurate representation of risk and, while we hope it never happens, a more efficient release of collateral in the event of a default. And then, of course, thirdly, we have our FTSE Russell intellectual property business, which is all around benchmarking. And we've seen that business grow to benchmarking worldwide $15 trillion of assets, uh, which now brings it clear water ahead of S&P and, and MSCI. <clears throat> but perhaps what's particularly interesting is how that spread around the world. With FTSE acquiring Russell Investments and the Russell Index and divesting Russell Investments, you have the biggest day of trading in the US calendar every year is the Russell Index rebalancing. So what we have here is really a global company. It happens to be called London, but I think many of us recognize London really as a concept, a space, a destination, where we can all come together as a community to help bring the best practice to our world. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, it's working. OK, good. Thank you for that um, um, excellent introduction. Um, uh, you mentioned that uh, you focus on three areas, the capital raising, risk management, and the benchmarking. Uh, in Saudi Arabia, we're still evolving in terms of structure of the financial sector capital market. Uh, we know uh, that the 2030 vision puts a lot of weight on the participation of the private sector, which will require funding, and the structure of the capital market and its ability to fund is detrimental in reaching that, the, those goals. Um, what can, and I, I, I have been following the UK trips to the US and their announcement to align themselves with the 2030 vision. Uh, how do you see uh, your group supporting in the 2030 vision and in what ways? This is one, and um, I'm very interested in risk management of the capital market structure and the benchmarking and how important is that in the development of the capital market? Right, well, thank you very much. <coughs> well, perhaps I can answer this question by an anecdote as to how we've seen our immediate capital markets in Europe evolve. In 2001, the economic and finance ministers of Europe commissioned a report known as the Wise Men Report, and you can Google it. It's, a, it's an excellent summary of the humble observation of demographics and its impact. And in developed countries, populations are growing older and living longer, which is a good thing. However, governments are no longer going to provide social security. The final salary pensions are a thing of the past. And there is a particular example. You can take a look on page 74 of this report, very famous. It said if the average career is 40 years and an individual wants to retire on 35% of their final salary. If real returns are 2% a year, then that individual needs to invest 20% of gross salary every year for 40 years. And really, today, how many people are truly doing that? That wise men report also made the observation that to make the capital markets more efficient was a priority in order to enable efficient long-term investment returns. But then we've had more recently a more dynamic starting line which is relevant to all of us today. How many remember January 2015, the surprise announcement of the Swiss National Bank taking the cap off the euro? The next week, we having the introduction of quantitative easing in Europe, effectively leading to negative interest rates in the continent, Switzerland, the Nordic regions like Japan. At a time when this demographic dynamic looking for growth, that search for growth, has begun to manifest in two areas. One, in addition to equities, 
buying the blue chips and mid and small caps, there has been an increasing demand to access the exposure to companies from countries that don't have negative interest rates. And that can include those here from the kingdom that in addition to domestic listing may also look for international listings. And in that regard as partners, we would love as London Stock Exchange Group to be your partner of choice. Thank you very much. And if I could just, uh, if I could just add to that, um, Claudia, or you know, just recapping some of the Vision 2030 objectives, those being uh, diversification of the economy, attracting foreign direct investment, um, and positioning, uh, positioning for more advanced capital markets in the kingdom, and how can we play a part? Um, you know, we uh, in our capital markets business represent a platform, what we would call a very fair, uh, symmetrical, and transparent platform where issuers of securities, i.e. corporates, financial institutions, and the government meet with investors in those securities um, at a price that is determined by investors and research analysts. So how can we play a part? We play a part by you know, having those securities listed at, at fair valuations, at valuations that benchmark with global comparable peer groups. We play a part through our secondary trading platforms like Turquoise, um, where uh, we make markets and provide liquidity in those securities. Because it's one thing to list the IPO at an attractive price, but what's equally beneficial and actually what drives those investors to come in is the security that there will be an aftermarket, there will be trading, um, and there will be support for that price with the market making uh, counterparties. And then as, as things move on, as indices um, you know, are formed, as countries are upgraded into classification systems, our FTSE and our FTSE, you know, FTSE index business plays a part. So I think we play a partner to the ecosystem of privatization, to an ecosystem that Vision 2030 will kick off. Uh, thank you. Uh, maybe there are another few interesting slides that you can show us in the capabilities of uh, LSE and what it can contribute to uh, developing the, the capital markets. And then we want to move on. I'm going to make my questions very brief so we can ask the audience to ask more challenging questions. But then after that, we want your perspective on what's happening in the global equity market in 2017, what happened, and what should we expect uh, in 18? Um, I think um, I think we can, um, oh yes, well, why not? We can, we can give a snapshot of uh, maybe what happened um, in our markets in 2017, and that was also a little bit of a response to what was happening in markets. So I think, you know, 2017 was, in all metrics, a stellar year in the global, uh, call it secondary and primary markets. Um, the, the US, um, I think, is currently, uh, you know, broken all records. I think the last record outstanding at the moment that the US has still to beat is a record from 1927 in terms of the number of days that, that have consecutively happened without a 5% downward move. And I think we are at currently 395 days of no 5% downward. So US momentum is there. You know, UK and European uh, markets are, are at all time highs as well. China at six, six and a half percent, uh, um, you know, delivered growth and expected growth um, is, it ha has kind of, you know, pushed back on any uh, observations of slowing down. India reaches new highs as well. On the back of that, and uh, on the back of quite low uh, volatility as measured by the VIX index or the fear index, we've had a ton and a volume of issuance uh, on our markets. And by our markets, we mean both London and Borsa Italiana. The page you have here focuses just on London. And we had 107 IPOs raising $20 billion or 15 billion pounds uh, raised last year. 60% of that was on our main market. About 40% of that was on our AIM high growth market. And if I could just end with one very important statistic, which just gives us a flavor of just how international 
London is as a listing venue and therefore why London would be a very appropriate partner for the kingdom as they go forth is that nine of the top 10 IPOs were international, were from companies that actually were not British companies. Um, and if I could give you a flavor of, of some of those companies just in Q4, this is a page just from Q4. And I'm just scrolling up and down. I think only one of these companies here, um, Glen V Properties PLC, happens to be UK. Everything else here in Q4 is international. <clears throat> and I think Vogel's raised a number of good points. <clears throat> I thought I'd provide some context. What does it mean to have 107 listings in a year? Uh, well, that compares with the prior year of just 65 listings. Um, but what's perhaps more interesting is when we look at other regions like North America, we had in London three listings in 2016, but 20 last year. And what's fascinating are some of the comments that we hear from some of those CEOs as to why they're doing so. <clears throat> the three comments that we often hear are one, to get access and visibility for our company in London to a very broad investor base. Number two, a research community that understands our market. <clears throat> and we had uh, a particular example, Cosmos Energy, oil company from Texas, uh, the CEO highlighted it's not just about shale oil, it's about understanding all the dynamics with all the insights from the other countries that are happening in those markets. And then liquidity, the different channels of execution that are possible on the combined London Stock Exchange and Turquoise access through a single connection. So those are some of the opportunities in terms of the immediate listings. But in addition to the visibility and the listings, is the opportunity for follow-on raisings, follow-on capital. And this is perhaps the most interesting aspect because once a company is in our London community, we recognize that the research community, the investors, they can be quite tough. <coughs> but if a company can persuade them of the value proposition, you'll often find a loyal community long-term institutional investors that will be with you to help you grow, and the ability to raise more follow-on capital. And if I just encourage you to look at the bottom right of that slide, <clears throat> there were more further issues on the London Stock Exchange Group last year than anywhere else, just highlighting the ability to raise further capital. We also saw, in addition to the normal listings of equities and fixed income, how funds have been very dynamic in terms of being able to innovate, to provide ways to help investors get their business done. Thank you very much. Um, on that note, um, I want to ask you the basic question. Um, what is the requirement, uh, we want to talk about two things. What is the requirement for a company to list in the stock exchange? Say if I was a large Saudi corporate, what would the benefit be? Maybe we touched upon, uh, upon some of the benefits. Uh, but specifically in terms of costs or requirements or difficulty to float, this is one. And what does the exchange play as a role if they do in that process? Uh, today in Saudi Arabia, we have, uh, we're just in the initial stage, we have uh, five asset classes, basically equities, uh, ETFs, REITs, uh, uh, Sukuk. Um, so, I mean, we're still developing. Uh, for what are the asset classes that are available in, in London Stock Exchange and which of the classes do you think are more important to um, increase to create market depth if there is um, anything to be said about that? Uh, I'll give a high level response and then hand over to my expert Goku with the detail. <coughs> but very humbly, progress is an equation, it's motivation plus ability. As an exchange we're in the enabling game every one of those asset classes that you've mentioned are available in the London Stock Exchange Group system. And we try to make it as efficient as possible in terms of the transparency and clarity of the rules process, the time to market of that process, and then afterwards, the three ingredients of capital raising, research, and ability to trade. But Goko, maybe you can suggest some detail. Thank you very much. 
Yes, yeah, sure. I think um, you know, Claude, your 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 point around kind of uh, eligibility and the requirement um, and, the and the speed. Yes, um, and what I would say is, if we look um, if we look right across the GCC, the Saudi capital market, the CMA, the Tadawul, is in fact you know by by leaps and bounds the most advanced and the most liquid uh, market in the GCC. If we look at the uh, advent of book building, you had it in your market a lo long before the UAE did. You had price range formation in your markets uh, long before uh, other parts of the GCC did. And you've had uh, you know, your corporate governance requirements, uh, which are, you know, which are uh, the most advanced in the GCC. So actually, if you benchmark the requirements to list on Tadawul with those on the LSC, they are actually remarkably similar. Within the LSC, you have, broadly speaking, uh, two uh, two markets uh, or two kind of paths to listing within our main market. That being a premium segment and a standard segment. Um, and just by way of precedent, for example, the company from the UAE, which we know as NMC Health PLC, or pre-merger, the company called Al Noor. These folks employed going into the London premium segment. Other companies like those from Egypt, like um, ADES, uh, ADES, which is oil field services, or IDH, Integrated Diagnostics Holding, which was an exit by Abraj Capital and Actus, chose to go standard. What you might find is standards, listing requirements, are probably more in tune with your local market. The premium segment sometimes has slightly more, let's call it uh, slightly more onerous requirements sometimes, like um, you need to have a listing sponsor appointed at all times. Uh, you, uh, you need to adhere or explain your adherence to the UK combined code. Um, um, you, when you do M&A, when you do uh, an acquisition, you need to uh, report it uh, based on certain class tests. But away from that, there is a lot of similarity, and, and actually the requirements to list are quite, um, uh, qu quite simple for companies from this region. Thank you. Uh, would you like to touch upon now uh, the issue of privatization? and uh, LSE's contribution or track record in supporting privatization? Thank you very much. <clears throat> I think it's been our privilege since 1984 to have participated and helped 48 different countries raise uh, over 400 billion uh, in terms of privatization proceeds. Three quarters of that is outside the UK. And it really reflects the nature of our ecosystem in terms of being able to raise that money. Thank you very much. I think uh, maybe we should open now the floor for some discussions, uh, questions. Steph Bassett. Uh, microphone. For the, uh, Vassal Ghalini, for just the, the benefit of our guests, you can introduce yourself. Baba Mr. Basil is well known. Uh, Basil Ghalini, BMG Financial Group. Two quick questions. First, macro one. With the Brexit now referendum out of the way, um, and uh, Theresa May is, is fighting her way to convince her counterparts to uh, um, uh, dictate uh, her own favor terms. How do you see the new, the new economic cycle in the UK for the next five years, let's say, for those who want to invest in the stock market, in the uh, 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 private equity market, or in the real estate market? That, that's an overall question. The other one, which relates to London Stock Exchange, as you know, uh, Saudi Arabia introduced what's so-called the market, the more market, which is equivalent to the A market in the UK. What kind of benefits you would tell the, um, the families who would like to do a list their shares on the A market in addition to the B market? Thank you very much, sir. <coughs> As always, an insightful series of questions. Thank you very much. It's an honor to see you again. 
I would say there, there are two aspects to your question. The first is, uh, in the context of the current political environment, what might be the future for kind of equities, <coughs> uh, REITs, um, private equity? And I would just humbly say, as a, as a humble practitioner, you know, Brexit is a major political event, but humbly, we have lived through many major political events. And as a focus on the private sector, that's where we will continue to try and help investors get their business done. I would say that the statistics that uh, we've shown recently highlights, if anything, the overall activity continues to grow. The international flavor continues to grow. We see that as a great vote of confidence in all of us as a community coming together in London. From a private equity point of view, there is a natural complement between the private and the public markets. So with private equity, we do see increasingly companies considering a dual tracked process, whether to go for a trade sale or some private equity um, transaction or through the public markets. But we also see through the cyclical nature of private equity, private equity managers will talk to us and tell us the traditional private equity portfolio might have one or two positions not performing well. They're always hoping to have one or two positions that might perform like the mythical unicorn, more than a billion dollars valuation as an unlisted company. But there's always a core of very high quality companies within a private, many private equity portfolios that may just be below the target IRR return. And these are ideal to come to the public markets. <clears throat> we also hear from many private equity that the scrutiny the diligence of the public markets is also very healthy in order to avoid the dynamic of just passing the parcel for higher and higher private valuations. Having that public balance is a good thing. So I think the positive relationship between private equity and public will continue. Uh, second thing, real estate investment trusts. In a macro environment where real returns are very low and you know, we have these negative interest rates in many developed countries, Real assets, particularly property-related assets, have been very popular. And the value of funds that have been raised on the London market in the last year is up more than three times in the prior year, four and a half times the funds, much of it through real estate investment trusts. And these real investment trusts <coughs> often are trading at a premium to asset value. And they can also service not just as yield vehicles, but also assets for other products, like underlying for Sukuk. And then more generally, in the equity markets, <clears throat> I would humbly suggest that the opportunity for growth will continue. Because when you need to have long-term investment return, it relies on compound interest. And really, that's our opportunity to promote growth in the equity markets. Now, with growth, we often see mid and small caps, and particularly the SME segment, highly relevant. And you mentioned, what about the SMEs and the AIM market? So the AIM market is a fantastic dynamic that's celebrated just over 20 years. Uh, earlier in 2017, the AIM market celebrated over 100 billion sterling raised across all of the companies that, that were raised. Today we have approximately 1,000 companies on AIM. Um, you know, some of them are small, just a few million in size. The biggest have grown to be multi-billion. And it's a market of two halves. We have a market where the vast majority, about 800 names, are market made uh, through voice negotiation over the screen. But the top 150 names are actually on the same order book as the FTSE 100 blue chips and the top 50 have exactly the same suite of execution channels as the biggest blue chips today. So for those entrepreneurs that are looking to learn, <clears throat> our elite program uh, encourages those private companies to meet with other CEOs and CFOs to learn about different types of equity, fixed income, and fund type financing. And through that relationship, they don't just cultivate friendships. They become customers of one another. They help with M&A. And that all contributes to our special ecosystem. Thank you very much, sir. And, and Basil, if I can um, just add to that, I think um, your, uh, your, 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 one of your questions was also around dual listing maybe between Nomu and AIM. And I think on, 
on the dual listing topic, uh, broadly speaking, we think dual listing typically only makes sense for the larger large cap situations. For situations that are on NOMU or AIM, it probably makes sense not to dual list because I think by definition these situations will be slightly smaller. So I think, you know, the AIM, AIM is a good market, I think, for us to, um, you know, further develop um, NOMU. Um, AIM is a very flexible market. Uh, we have companies like uh, Afriton last year that raised just two and a half million pounds. And we have companies um, that raised close to 500 million pounds uh, just last year on, Ray, uh, uh, on AIM. So it's a very flexible market. It is a high growth market. It's got a slightly differentiated positioning, regulatory oversight, um, um, and, um, and segmentation to our main market. Uh, and I think there is place for both. But perhaps the dual listing is probably a reserve for the larger situations. Just we are having problems with the more market right now. Right. We have this list of key things. Mm -hmm. And people, some families now retrieve mm -hmm. from, from listing on, on, on the move. So we want to tell them maybe, maybe to add one more ad advantage or benefit is to consider dual listing, be right. it London, be it Dubai, be it other markets. Understood. So just to make it more attractive for SMEs to continue with their plans for the NOMO market. I see. Okay. In, in that, uh, thank you for the color. In that context, you know, where you, where you have a little bit of headwinds on mar one market, use the other market until things sort out on this market. Uh, it, could, it could work very flexibly and very well. I'm just going to add a point. Uh, Dr. Uh, Barnes, uh, uh, I cannot uh, let this question go. The Brexit, sen the sentiment after Brexit. It's an excellent question. And um, I would like to uh, just ask you for is the, um, the UK or the international, the UK uh, sentiment in the economy uh, post Brexit? Positive or negative, number one. And if it is negative, then what kind of strategies or things they are considering now? I know UK is going, uh, trying to find out, uh, uh, you know, expand its outreach in outside economies. Uh, but um, just positive or negative, this is one. And on the NMU, which I totally agree, and uh, we want to learn from the LSE uh, model, really. And most of our questions is, how can we further develop our markets, and in particular, the regulations? NMU is new, has a lot of restrictions. We didn't touch upon the particular requirements and regulations to list, for example, whether on your primary market or secondary market. <coughs> so maybe if you can shed some light on that so we can compare. Thank you. Well, <coughs> I will express my personal opinion, uh, which you might need to take with a grain of salt, but I'm a natural optimist, so I'm positive. Uh, <coughs> but I do think that whatever dynamic we're in, where the dynamic is change, there are opportunities. And I think never before have we been in a period now where there is a greater opportunity to cooperate. And as financial centers, if we connect, we thrive. Would you like to speak to the next? Thank you. Y yes, and, and Clude, I think on your on your Brexit point, if I can just add from a pure stock exchange perspective, and let's make it stock exchange specific, and maybe kind of you know Saudi Arabia or GCC specific, um, business in Europe or securities placement business in Europe and London is done via a series of selling restrictions. So by by that I mean when you list on London, it does not stop. Um, the London listed security at IPO to tap into investors sitting in Germany, Switzerland, Netherlands or France because you are approaching those destinations on the institutional segment through selling restrictions. You have a UK LA which is the main markets regulator. You have a UK LA approved prospectus. Um, through that prospectus you can approach both professional and retail investors in the UK and through selling restrictions you can approach uh, um, institutional investors in Europe, as an example. Uh, so when we hear from a Brexit perspective the loss of what they call passporting, that is the inability to perhaps sell into Dutch retail or French retail. Uh, but frankly, a company from uh, the GCC or Saudi Arabia um, you know, is going to be mainly an institutional play. It's going to be an institutional securities offering 
the only retail component that a company may enjoy is going to come from high net worth and private banking channels that in any case get aggregated up into institutional orders from private banks so you know that's an that's that's uh, that's something around uh, the lack of any um, brexit related uh, capital market flow and new issuance flow we might face um, your second point uh, was it around um, Yes, around the aim, was it? Was it around aim? Um, yes. So I think it was, um, y you know, and I think it was an interplay around listing requirements on main versus aim. I think that was, uh, you know. Aim versus our talent. What do you yes. Do you yes. I, I hear you. Um, so, you know, the, the, the aim, um, um, you know, it is not a market that is regulated by our regulator. The UKLA actually does not approve the prospectus um, on the AIM market. It's actually the, uh, a combination of the LSC and what we call the NOMAD, which is the nominated advisor. So there is a lot of uh, the, 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 the regulatory oversight, the regulatory burden, and the eligibility to list. Does this, is this stock, is this equity story eligible for listing? Has been passed along to the broker community, uh, to, to the exchange for the review of the documents but then to the brokerage, i.e. the financial advisory community, known as the nomad, the nominated advisor. So the nominated advisor actually deems whether, um, whether the company is fit for listing, whether the financials are good enough, what the continuous obligations should be, um, and you know, ultimately it survives or fails based on the nomad and the investors. It has is, it, it is kind of got a little bit of less regulation. Um, but you know, in terms of what can you what, what can you learn? I mean, these high growth markets they do go through their ups and downs, and I think sometimes it's just a little bit of a network effect. You need enough success stories in there, such that even if there are a few, um, you know, not so successful stories, people focus on, on on the successes. So I think as Nomu develops, as the SMEs of Saudi Arabia get listed quicker. And we're doing our part, uh, whatever we can, to help that through our elite platform. Um, you'll find that there will be more traction, more, mo more momentum, and more acceptance of Nomu. Thank you very much for coming to Riyadh. I am uh, Turki Fedag from Al Bilad Capital. I am head of research and uh, advisory. Uh, I would like my uh, ask my Arabic, please. With the exit of Britain from Europe, because of your knowledge of the financial sectors in the United States, what are the most important sectors that are likely to be affected by the exit from the European Union? Okay, so the question is also due to Brexit. Uh, as we exit Brexit, which of the industries you think will be most impacted? Well, <coughs> thank you very much, sir, for your excellent question. Uh, well, I would say, <coughs> firstly, as a group, London Stock Exchange is active in all of the geographies inside and outside of the Eurozone. So we hope humbly to be able to service whatever motivation may be in whatever industry may be. But Gogol, do you have any particular sector insights? Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Um, so in terms of, um, in terms of, um, uh, you know, your question is which, I think you meant in a, in a UK economy, which sectors do we think will be most impacted by Brexit? And I think, um, I think that's got to be, um, you know, just thinking through this a little bit, um, you know, clearly real estate is one. And by that I mean, uh, you know, both in terms of the leasing companies, the companies that are landlords and lease real estate, as well as the companies that are in the business of developing real estate. Um, you know, potentially you may see um, a slight, um, uh, you know, hit to that industry, and I say that only because you know you you you've read the same press as we do. There will be you know certain companies, certain organizations that may look to you know 
you know, move some of their staff. And with staff, it comes with the commercial properties as well as residential. So, you know, perhaps, um, perhaps real estate could be one of those sectors. Um, and, um, and, and, you know, maybe some of the sectors that, uh, that real estate and population touches, like perhaps, um, you know, so perhaps parts of retail, like fashion retail, grocery retail, et cetera, as perhaps uh, you have a little bit of a population aberration as you go along. Thank you. I would like to ask the question in a different way. The United States has been able to get out of the European Union and to get out of it. المملكة العربية السعودية أيضا فيما يخص الاتحاد الخليجي الذي تعثر لنفرض أنه حدثت مفاوضات ثنائية ما بين المملكة المتحدة وما بين السعودية لإقامة سوق حر أو نوع من أنواع العلاقات الاقتصادية ما هي المزايا ما بين الجانبين؟ Okay, so I have to translate. Okay. Um, um, uh, he says, you know, the UK is going to move forward, Brexit is going to happen, and then uh, the U uh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, uh, referring to the GCC unification, which is not going to happen. He says, what if uh, bilateral agreements or discussions uh, happen between the UK and Saudi to establish some sort of a trade? Well, uh, what kind of relationship? A, uh, like uh, some kind of favorable uh, relationship, trade, or whatever between uh, UK and Saudi. How would that benefit us? And what, um, yeah, how would, how, where do you see the benefit from? Uh, well, if I, <coughs> if I could humbly respond, sir, I mean, the reality is, even in our last answer, we are really just speculating at best because the negotiation of Brexit hasn't really formally kicked off until later this year. <coughs> Um, but clearly, any opportunity to allow issuers a more efficient process to raise capital, to allow that risk capital to convert into working capital will allow entrepreneurs to grow. And for all of us working together <coughs> to minimize the slippage cost, to minimize the frictional cost at the act of buying and selling can clearly be in all of our interests. So maybe I might humbly invite Gokul. Can we go to section four? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> because I'd just like to show a very brief case study around what is turquoise, how it is actually helping this process to become more efficient. Now, this picture here shows how the global ecosystem of investors can have, through a single connection into our London data center, access to both the London Stock Exchange and turquoise. Now, the question is, what does that mean? It means the ability to buy and sell, there's a broader suite of options to buy and sell than any other stock market in the world through a single connection. On the primary stock exchange, we have the opening auction, the midday auction, the intraday trading, but the jewel is the closing auction, the record of reference to determine asset value every day, which is particularly important for the passive index funds. But what we also know is that the passive indexation, which while it's the fastest growing component of assets under management, passive funds only represent about 25% of assets under management worldwide. 75% are still the stock pickers that are looking to trade when they wish to do so as active managers. And on the right side, you can see a suite of additional channels that Turquoise offers, which also includes, if I can do a um, hand uh, illustration, if I say my fingers are the bid price and the offer price, two bid at four, Turquoise allows one to also place a firm order at the midpoint at three for potential price improvement and do electronic blocks. And if, Goko, if you go to the next slide, mm -hmm. through the single connection, you can get access to lots of markets. But go to the next slide. The next slide, <clears throat> I just wanted to show you the dynamic of an instrument that's available on a primary market and on turquoise, which can be a proxy for the dual listing we've been talking about. So if you go to the first one, which is the black line, you might recognize this is Volkswagen, a blue chip, very well known, very well respected. But we've chosen the date, 24th of August. You might recall the time with the emissions stories coming out. And on the y-axis for this day chart, a very large percentage movement in that blue chip. 
Now, if we go to the next slide, you'll notice it looks exactly the same. These are the turquoise prices right on top of the primary. <clears throat> so even though these are two separate physical platforms, the electronic trading ecosystem effectively keeps them in line. So that is the first insight. The next picture, please. The next picture highlights the dynamic of the global investors. And a subset of them, many of them you'll recognize in that list, like Norgis, the large sovereign fund, AXA, the large investor uh, and insurance company from France, Bailey Gifford from Scotland, BlackRock, the big global asset manager, um, Fidelity, Franklin Templeton, many of them that you'll recognize, um, did a great big beauty parade in 2015 to choose a preferred partner for the buying and selling of securities, and particularly through electronic block trading. And there were 20 firms, including NASDAQ and Euronext and others, and we were very privileged at the end of this process. From 20 to 7 to 3, they selected Turquoise London Stock Exchange Group as preferred partner. And if we go to the next slide, we might see what's actually happened. On the left side, you'll see the growth of Turquoise value traded every year across all of those execution channels. And here is a innovation, an idea that grew in less than 10 years to more than a trillion euros of turnover a year. And this is reflection of the ecosystem coming together at the same time. But the chart on the right, you see with that red circle, that is the growth in the innovation we recently designed together in the ability to trade multi-million single ticket items as an on order book, multilateral open access order book. And what you'll see on that chart, as you kindly mentioned the word Brexit, you'll see on that chart on the x-axis, this little tiny at the bottom red arrow, the UK referendum. On that day, it turned out to be the biggest trading day in the history of the London Stock Exchange, 1.7 million trades. Uh, the biggest day on turquoise, 1.9 million trades, everything resilient. But that has been dwarfed by the continued growth in the innovation, working in partnership with the global asset managers and brokers. If we go to the next slide, um, this is the chart that I think should be encouraging for all of us in this room. Turquoise is an interesting proxy for multi-country investment. Turquoise has 19 countries, over 4,000 securities, and what this chart shows on the x-axis, it starts at January 2013, up until the end of last year. On the y-axis, we're measuring if a stock symbol is active, if buyers and sellers are active in a stock symbol, it counts. And we had, at the beginning of 2013, 1,600 different stock symbols active. Today, it's more like 3,000 stock symbols active. So the question is, why does this matter? Well, ladies and gentlemen, when we realize that across all the European order book stock exchanges, every day, 80%, 80% of the value that trades is concentrated in just 300 blue chips, going from 1,600 active symbols up to 3,000 symbols suggests two very important insights. One, Global investors are searching for growth also through mid and small cap securities. They're going down the market cap table. But number two, they are, those global investors are succeeding in finding liquidity, the other side of the trade, in London on those international securities. And if we go to the next page, this is an example of the AIM securities that you mentioned. Basil, that was a very good question. We've added the top AIM 50. Now, the AIM securities tend to be a bit smaller than the others, and as we know, the bid offer spreads tend to widen, and that's the frictional cost. By being able to trade at the midpoint, you can save significant slippage cost and get potential price improvement. And just since October, we've traded over half a billion dollars of turnover, and over 63% uh, of the act activity has been done at the midpoint, saving half the bid offer spread. Now, this chart here, uh, I'll just got two last charts to show you. This chart is a blue chip, a FTSE 100 company. Next, you might know it's a retailer. What we're showing here are the prices through a single day. The x-axis is a single trading day. Y-axis is price. Most of those trade prices are the average trade size on order book. And what we know worldwide, go back to that slide, the order size is constantly shrinking because if one has one large buy and one small sell, you get a small fill. Order books worldwide have shrinking trade size, and yet 
Look at those great big bubbles. That's the electronic block trading done through turquoise, available through that link to the London Stock Exchange. So if a company secondary lists on London, you can trade on LSE and turquoise, and look at where those bubbles are trading. They're not trading only in the closing auction. They're not trading only in the close. They're trading early in the day. Go to the next slide, please. I heard that this distinguished chamber also heard from the King of Spain. Here we have a very important Spanish blue chip, Caixa Bank, where you can see those great big bubbles trading during the day. What this shows is that through the cooperation, through the partnership with the global asset managers, we're able to offer execution channels to both the active and the passive asset managers to help them get their business done. And what we hope to do in the final slide is just to show you that picture again by offering more knobs on the radio dial. We hope to reduce the slippage cost, reduce the cost of investment to help contribute to long-term investment returns. Thank you very much. Hi, uh, my name is Omar Alzamil. Uh, I want to say thank you for Mr. Brazilton and uh, thank you, Mrs. Uh, Blood, and uh, thank you, Dr. Robert and uh, uh, Jokel. Uh, I have a question about the uh, Saudi market. In, 2000, uh, in uh, October 2017, Saudi market applied to, uh, to listed in FTSE. But uh, the FTSE declined uh, the listed uh, in March 2018. Uh, can you please uh, give us, like, uh, prepares uh, how the be uh, benefit of Saudi market will be uh, uh, effect for uh, Saudi investor? Well, sir, thank you very much. That was an unsolicited question, but uh, just happened to be prepared just in case. So what is fascinating about the FTSE country classification? Number one, it's completely transparent and public from a process. So everything I'm about to say, all of you can also view from the FTSE Russell website. And I think what's fascinating is that there was a statement that came out following the September meeting, which you refer to. And I'd just like to uh, just read from this, if I may. Uh, Saudi Arabia was added to the watch list in September 2015, following the introduction of the Qualified Foreign Investor Scheme. So that's a positive. During 2017, the Capital Markets Authority of Saudi Arabia and the Saudi Arabia Stock Exchange, Tadawul, have introduced a number of improvements to the market infrastructure aimed at opening the domestic market to international investors. These include, but are not limited to, the simplification of the QFI registration process, the introduction of T plus two settlement cycle, delivery versus payment uh, model in April 2017. Consequently, the FTSE Russell Country Classification Advisory Committee has endorsed the following criteria rating changes. And these are all upgrades that have now been applied. So a number of the criteria have been up uploaded. One, two, three, four, five, six of them have been upgraded. And honestly, I think that is one of the highest number of upgrades that anyone in the market has ever seen for a single country market. And uh, humbly, I think great credit is due to the Capital Markets Authority and Total Wolf for doing this. Um, and then I'll just say, I'm just reading now from the public statement. Saudi Arabia is to be congratulated on the pace of recent market reforms, which are widely acknowledged as being positive. As a result of these reforms, it is anticipated that Saudi Arabia will meet the requirements for inclusion as a secondary emerging market from early 2018, when further enhancements to the independent custody model, ICM, are scheduled to be introduced. Accordingly, FTSE Russell will proceed with the launch of a standalone Saudi Arabia country index and global and regional Saudi Arabia inclusion indices to assist domestic and international investors who wish to seek early index-based exposure to the market. And what I would just humbly say, if I might, just as, a, as an opinion, this is a very strong, positive message from a committee that is not 
the voice of the exchange. It is not the voice of the executives of the index company. This is the collective advice from the global asset management industry. So for that, I think it's very clear to be congratulated. I think, why does this matter? Because if you look at the current classifications in the frontier market, mainland China, in the secondary mar emerging, you have uh, countries like Russia, advanced emerging Turkey, developed like UK. Effectively, what this is saying is that through completing this next step, immediately will jump directly into secondary emerging, leapfrogging the frontier market. I think that is very remarkable and it reflects the size and importance of this market. Thank you very much. And, and if I could just add to, uh, add to uh, uh, Dr. Barnes over there, I think you have a very interesting time uh, uh, based on what you just mentioned on FTSE. By that I mean, based on what's going to happen March 2018, you know, there are two big demand drivers. Demand, uh, demand on the part, on, demand on the part of international investors to be involved in Saudi stories. Demand when, let's say, FTSE uh, classifies Saudi as secondary emerging. So that will uh, require uh, passive uh, funds to track the market. And demand as a result of the QFIs that have already set themselves up at Tadawul and that are continuing to come in uh, and set themselves up. So there is demand today from the part of international investors to get involved, both active and passive. And you have supply coming out of Saudi today as indicated by the government as well as other private sector entities. Um, so you have a very interesting time where you know more focus, more scrutiny as global investors, as Dr. Barnes said, global investors looking for growth. Well, guess what? They're looking at the Middle East and they're looking at Asia for, Asia for growth. And you have a very kind of happy medium where the country is also producing those equity stories to meet that growth. Before we turn to the next question, I just want to add a statistic. Uh, looking at the value invested by qualified financial investors recently published by the CMA, if you look at statistics of December 2015, it was around 425 million value invested by Q, uh, qualified financial investors. Uh, third quarter or December 2016 was 1.9 billion uh, and I was just looking at the last quarter 2017 7.2 billion so in in, in, um, in 12 months it's uh, three times three folds uh, and this and the CMA just recently uh, loosened up the qualified uh, investors um, uh, requirements so mm -hmm. I think that's a good sign that uh, doing this will have a bigger inflow which we want into the market Absolutely, and some of that is also exp um, taking a call on what's happen going to happen at FTSE and what's going to happen a couple months later at MSCI. So I think the you know foreign investors are taking a view that FTSE and MSCI will come out a certain way, and they don't want to. They they sort of want to be a part of that uptick in valuations on Tadawul, and therefore they're coming into the stories today in advance of that message. My name is uh, Engineer Majid al Nuremish, and I'd like to thank the panelists for their presentation. Actually, I don't have a question. I have uh, points, and I'd like to hear your comments regarding some policies. Uh, as I understand that the stock exchange of the capital market is a mirror for the economy, and the London Stock Exchange is a very old stock exchange. And when we see, I have actually five points to choose to answer one or two or three or two. Uh, the first point, out of around 60 stock or capital markets in the world, there are the top 10 in the market value. And this accounts 85% of the market value of all the capital markets. And uh, at the top of them is NASDAQ and so on. In the European Union, when we see there is a sustainable development goals that has been approved 1st of January 2016 up to 2030. And there are 17 goals and has been signed by all the heads of the states at 26th of September 2015. 
one of these goals is the green economy. So what I'm talking, green economy, it means everything related to a green. Uh, Munkid, can we make it shorter and to the point, please? Yes. I'm saying that the companies listed, it has to be aligned with the green economy, not with the brown economy. Is such a policy and regulations is in your stock exchange to be adopted, this is one. Second, when we see the woman, woman empowerment in the European Union, when you see the chair, the board chairs, the oldest stock exchange is Amsterdam. And when you see how many seats in the board for the ladies is 7%. The European Union took a decision that 2024 has to be raised to 20%. So what is the regulation? If you reflect it here in Saudi Arabia, out of 171 companies listed with an average of seven Cs, then we are talking about 1,200. And the latest contribution is maybe less than 1%. So is there is some kind of a regulation to be imposed for this that goes in parallel with the SDGs as a woman, woman empowerment, this too. And I have three, but yeah, and thank you. Thank you, so we'll yes. stop at those two. Thank you very much. Well, sir, may I just thank you for raising two very important points uh, which we are fully embracing. So firstly, on the green economy, Many may realize in the United Nations, a group called the PRI and many of the largest global investors signed up for socially responsible investing and green dynamic. And London Stock Exchange Group last year to help companies focus on the variables that matter published a document called ESG Guidance, Environmental Social Governance Guidance. And we'd be very happy to give you a copy electronically so you can share with the chamber because we want to enable those companies that want to embrace the green principles to be able to make visible the metrics, but to do it in an efficient way that doesn't cost a lot to provide that positive visibility. Yes. Yes. Yes, and I think even the London Stock Exchange was amongst the first to be embracing the uh, SSE, the uh, Social Stock Exchange principles that are aligned with that. I would also mention on the uh, diversity and uh, kind of women empowerment, um, in addition to specific prescriptive regulation, there's also, um, I guess, a kind of a community uh, embracing of a peer pressure or community a gathering and um, in the UK London Stock Exchange Group has signed up to what's called the 30% Club where 30% of senior management or 30% of board representatives happen to be gender diverse and I'm pleased to say that um, a statistic I heard recently was that most of the blue chips or companies that are listed in London um, everyone has at least one woman on the board but that that is all moving in the right direction so that that's over the 30% uh, but would certainly welcome your third question, sir. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So we'll take a question from here. Uh, engineer Hassan Al Jabari, uh, I'm an old Aramco design and uh, refinery and terminal design engineer. So my interest is in Aramco now, which is uh, um, what are your views on the potential Aramco offering, and also what are how are you eyeing as uh, LSE? Uh, getting involved in the offering? Well, sir, thank you very much for your question. Um, I hope you will give us some indulgence and uh, understand that we never speak about specific companies that are in the pipeline uh, or, or private engagements. But what we will share are some of the criteria that matter for those companies from any country that are very significant. Having an international IPO, an international listing, can be positive to help that company achieve its goals and help reflect the international importance of such a company. 
Uh, Gokul, would you like to add any other points on some of those macro criteria? Thank you. I, I think to, to add to that, I think in any, um, in any of the privatizations across the region that might be coming, and we've seen that uh, most recently in the UAE around the ad hoc distribution IPO as well, there's a lot coming out of the GCC. There are more coming out of Saudi Arabia. And I think as uh, the offer sizes on some of these transaction are, uh, transactions are going to be and expected to be large and sig significant, and perhaps an international investor base needs to get involved in these stories over and above the QFIs, I think having an international listing location could be quite beneficial across these privatizations as we see them unfolding. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Abdulaziz al Um and my question is aligned with him. So I guess let's, if we, if you allow me, put it to put it in a different perspective. So in regard to the Aramco IPO, so let's say historical data, historical markets. When you have a substantial, heavy weighted company going into the market, as an investor, you're concerned about not the company, other companies having individuals liquidating their shares to invest in this potential company. So in terms of uh, market dynamics, usually what happens in terms of the activity when a company historically uh, gets uh, IPO'd? I know the, the topic of Aramco is very interesting and we at the committee probably had this as a first question and then I was reminded that we cannot speak about specific clients per se. That's why, but th I think the question is legitimate and, and, and your experience and hosting so many large IPOs, mm -hmm. which I saw on several of the slides, what impact would that have on others in, in the market, I think? Um, uh, thank you for the question. I think, you know, and, and, and just to kind of um, validate it, I think what your question is, is there a danger or a risk that when a, such a large kind of IPO comes that people are forced to sell holdings in other situations to invest here, and therefore, what can it do to the secondary prices of those other situations? Well, I think there are, there are two ways to answer this question. One is if we look at privatizations globally, and second is if we look at subsidiary spin-offs. And I think let me, let me start with subsidiary spin-offs first. And what do we mean by that? We mean um, situations like when, Nas when, when Nestle spun off its eye care unit, Alcon, or when AT&T spun off AT&T Wireless, when um, BT, British Telecom, spun off O2, uh, or when in, in Singapore, Capita spun off Capital Land. Typically, the spun off entity or the entity pursuing a separate listing out of the mothership typically had a differentiated enough equity story for it not to require a sale and a purchase, but incremental demand from an incremental investor base for a new equity story. In the region, most recently, we saw it when Imar um, listed Imar Moles Group, and then again when Imar listed Imar Development. In both these situations, although there was a little bit of, let's say, uh, uh, commentary and fear that would Imar be sold in order for investors to buy either of those two situations, we, uh, we, we, well, there may have been a little bit, but there was not enough to impact the price of the company that was doing the spin. And now if we go back to the privatizations, if we look at the big privatizations in Brazil, China, India, Russia, uh, if you look at what happened at Gazprom or Rosneft, these were big uh, situations. Uh, again, we didn't, uh, we didn't see evidence of that that actually hurt other secondaries. So typically, it, it, it leads to new demand. Um, you know, the marketing activities around such a large transaction, whether it's a Russian one or a spin-off, is so intense you know, you know, going, you know, uh, such a global roadshow, such a massive marketing effort that the banks, the advisory community typically, and we hopefully as the exchange, are able to uncover and unlock 
incremental demand, not just demand that came as a result of selling other securities. Hi, this is Tarek Twajri. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. So I would like to ask about, I will go back to Nemo market again. So uh, I, would I would like to hear from you what's the requirement for investor to access a market? Uh, are there any restrictions or uh, requirements for institutional or uh, individual investors? Secondly, uh, how we can uh, benefit as an investor or as a listed like Tadawal or CMA from the market experience? And uh, what's the main driver for liquidity in the M market? As you know, there is, uh, it's not like the main market can be uh, covered by a lot of uh, analysts. So there is uh, some list, some formation cannot be getting from, uh, because of uh, the requirement uh, of the listing. So it's, let's say we can call it uh, have due diligence. So it's not, uh, so I would like to hear uh, from you what what, uh, what how, how we can uh, uh, benefit from the experience for last 20 years. Yes, thank you very much. An excellent question. And with your permission, we will share with you a publication uh, that we just completed called A Guide to Entrepreneurs. It's specifically from AIM. It interviews a number of the successful CEOs that have raised the issuance. And it tells about the journey, about pre-IPO, selecting the advisors, going through the process, and then life after the IPO. And I think you'll find, all of you will find that really insightful and a beautiful case study we're happy to share. But I would say that AIM benefits from partnership with the community. So Gokul mentioned the role of the nominated advisor to help the company navigate the process the opportunity to also have research coverage for the security and aftermarket trading. But there's also been a very close support with the public sector. So the public sector, particularly the government, have also provided a number of incentives for individual investors in AIM. So for example, the stamp tax purchase of half a percent on UK equities is waived for AIM securities. There is business property relief, inheritance tax, and a number of incentives uh, to allow individuals to invest in a tax-efficient way, reduces slippage cost for long-term investor returns. Also, this chart that Gokul has put up highlights clearly the ecosystem and the ingredients in this process seem to be working because more than two-thirds of all the capital that's been raised in Europe has actually come from the AIM market. And in fact, this year, Europe now has the European SME growth market. AIM is already very active in, in representing the majority of that. So we will very happily share with you this guide for entrepreneurs that explains the process of AIM. And of course, it's not to prescribe, but just to share some examples and insights. And you can probably cherry pick what is best for the community here. Thank you very much, sir. Just, uh, just following up on that, and if we look at, uh, you know, how, how do we read this chart? I think it's to say that in the kind of high growth, uh, in the high growth, small to mid cap world, it appears to be a winner takes all market, where AIM, for example, here has taken market share away from every single other European exchange. If you, if you look at some of the um, differences, perhaps, between AIM and the Nomu market, AIM is not a UK small mid-cap. It is a global small mid-cap. So if we dissect AIM, uh, what you will find is you have a lot of companies from Canada, North America, Africa, um, and Southeast Asia on AIM. Um, I think what you have on Nomu is that it's primarily today a Saudi, uh, a Saudi story. And if you take the winner takes all argument on board, I think perhaps something the Nomu could think about, perhaps, you know, if you want to learn from AIM, 
is maybe a winner-takes-all strategy for the GCC or Middle East, where Namu becomes the high-growth market for the region at large, rather than just Saudi. Because I think that might um, uh, propel some of those network effects that we were discussing. More companies come, more successes, um, and therefore fewer failures that get highlighted. And on your prior question around uh, how do you invest on AIM, I think that's a little bit more of a procedural point. How do you as an investor part participate? You know, it is through a brokerage firm, um, certain intermediary functions uh, set up on the London market, and we can give you a few of the, uh, the names. need to do for the investor to invest in the AIM market, like what we mm -hmm. have here, so, or it's open for all, even in the business or institution? No, not in the second, in the secondary market, uh, in the secondary market, so absolutely no restrictions. You can, uh, you can, I think, theoretically uh, buy a single share of a stock. I think uh, Mr. Tariq is because in Namu here, mm -hmm. the investors are only, they have to be qualified investors, mm -hmm. institutions or with a certain know-how. Uh, so uh, we have a problem with liquidity because of this restriction. So that's mm -hmm. what he's referring mm -hmm. to. And you did mention on this, your market, that uh, the approval is just from the exchange and the advisors. And I find that interesting because in our case, no, it's still the same regulator. Yes, mm -hmm. a more uh, less requirement. Uh, but it's, it's different, so your, your model is interesting. Hi, uh, my name is Shravan, and it's pleasure to see you, all the panelists over here. My question is, I want to gather your attention towards the global market. So, because Alice, we have the companies across the globe, the revenue is driven from the globe, not only from the UK. So, uh, I would like to ask that what all uh, risks that you see in the global financial market at the moment or in the future? Of course, uh, we have the synchronized growth, how it will end, we don't know. So uh, if you can color on mainly on the risk management and on risk print, that would be great. Thank you. Right, well, thank you very much. <coughs> well, I would just make the humble observation that we don't know the future any better than anyone else does, but what we can do is focus on the process to make it as transparent, as fair, and as efficient as possible. And I think when we looked at the ingredients of what makes a successful listing, including, sir, for your good questions about the big national companies, the ability to raise capital from the global investors, and we're privileged to have global investors that have been active from around the world, active in London. Number two, research. A very sophisticated community of those that are willing to provide real scrutiny, a real challenge to the companies to prove their value. But if you win that value, and you persuade those investors, you get loyalty and long-term institutional investment, patient capital. And then third, the ability to buy and sell. And I would just humbly observe, liquidity of a market is not based on the overall big number. Liquidity is on a per stock symbol. And that is why you'll notice that a number of the different segments that we offer which we have designed in partnership with the investors, will have their focused different type of execution channels to help them to get their business done. So I would hope that as we all work together, we as just the humble market operator, we are listening and we want to implement the ideas that you have to make it all effective for all of us. I would also say we are blessed to be in a community where everyone, no matter what country the issuer comes from, everyone is treated fairly on our level playing field. And what we've heard from a number of the recent uh, issuers is they also like the fact that in the London community, we don't have a culture of class action lawsuits. We focus more on the investment. And uh, may that long continue. Thank you. Hi, my name is Mohammed Al-Shugir. 
uh, actually, I have a question about the ex stock exchange. I think, do you know about the uh, stock exchange in Saudi Arabia happened in 2006 and then uh, uh, America 2008? Do you think that will happen in the UK when, when they get out of the uh, European Union? He's referring to a kind of a dip or a crash. That dip I mean, w will the exiting the Brexit have a negative impact on the stock market? And I think we covered that question, but if, if you... I think I would just respond. What we saw in the market right after the EU referendum result, which was on the 24th of June 2016, uh, I think everyone observed that there was a drop in the sterling value, although that seems to have recovered quite a bit since then. And also, since that EU referendum result, um, we've actually seen a surge of listings, whether that's equity, funds, fixed income. As a humble market operator, we've focused on the process. And so one of the other markets we've introduced, and I can see uh, fixed income innovation that Gokul's put up on the screen, we've introduced a new market called the ISM, the International Securities Market, to provide more certainty for a faster process in terms of time to enabling fixed income to come to the market, less documentation, that means less cost for issuers, and to the extent where an issuer already has an equity listing or some other program, uh, the documentation is even lighter, just a term sheet, to be able to reuse the effort that has already been done already in the public domain. Thank you. And just to add to that, um Sir, your question around um, you know any uh, any stock market wobble around Brexit, you know how does how do how do prices of securities move? The price of a security contains all publicly available information within it, so the price of a security moves due to supply and demand, liquidity factors, as well as surprises. Surprise and supply demand drives stock prices, and and effectively the Brexit. Um, and, and, and the fact that it's happening and that um, March 2019 will signal the exit of the UK from the EU is already in the market. So whatever you know, pricing uh, impact that had to happen has already happened. So no, uh, we, we don't think at the moment of exit or Brexit there will be any, um, any kind of aberration to stock price. Thank you. And uh, before we wrap up, I will give you a very challenging question from my father. <laughs> You, you have to have a question. Okay. Or, uh, question or It's not going to be a challenging question. It's uh, uh, looking at the uh, the uh, London stock market and your mission guys here. Uh, I have seen that very kind words from you and very polite words from you regarding. Saudi stock market, the economy, and so on and so forth, which is very nice. I mean, that's what we'd expect, expect from some people who are visiting. Uh, however, probably some, some very uh, sort of uh, critical uh, points that would help in the development uh, that is uh, actually uh, is being sought, uh, especially for you guys are, are coming from, uh, you're seeing the situation our macro situation, or the Saudi macro situation. You're seeing it from abroad. You can have a very neutral look at it. And uh, we will appreciate a, some sort of an insight, uh, not polite, not politically polite, but uh, I would say uh, scientifically and critically fair. And the question is, or at least the general question, is on the macro aspect. Uh, there is no question that uh, in the region, as in, in the, and I mean by the region, the GCC region, and Saudi Arabia, uh, basically, uh, on the general macro aspect, we have seen in uh, 17, as well as in the beginning 18, and end of, nine, of, of, of the 16, a some sort of a, a major development, uh, major ups and downs, drop in oil and so on and so forth, associated also with some political restructuring, if you wish, social and political restructuring. All this culminate into, I would say, the, uh, uh, the risk factor, as well as the incentive for an investment. 
whether it is local investment, I'm talking about long term, or foreign investment coming into here. So from your general non-Saudi perspective, what would you think uh, the general macro aspect prospect in Saudi Arabia and the GCC countries? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for that excellent question. I'll say a few words and then invite Gokul. Uh, again, my humble view uh, as an optimist tends to be positive. But I look at a few macro points. One, we've got the vast majority of investment by asset management worldwide is from developed countries where the demographics uh, and the pension dynamics are encouraging a search for growth. And that is in an environment where we've got low interest rates, low returns, I think very positive for those countries that you have GDP is growing relatively faster than others. And I think here in the region, and I think here in the kingdom, many of the economists are forecasting growth, and that seems to reflect the young demographics that are also growing at the time when you're also innovating in the capital markets. So I think that's positive. Where I think we can help um, in terms of sharing examples and insights is clearly, as a capital market, we and our whole community have been through a process, a history, of doing experiences like privatization, like doing various types of dual listings, where candidly, in our capital markets, mistakes were made or things were done that were inefficient. And we would hope by sharing that insight, by just giving you those examples, you might also be able to leapfrog and avoid those types of mistakes through our type of cooperation and partnership. Thank you very much, sir. I think to conclude, I would just uh, first say uh, thank you, everybody, for attending. And um, it's been a very uh, fulfilling uh, session. And I can't draw many conclusions. Uh, it's definitely in line with the objective of our committee uh, to promote the development of the capital market. So thank you for all your insights uh, tonight. And we definitely look forward, as a committee and the chamber, to developing the relationship further with the London Stock Exchange. Uh, thank you very much, and I leave the, uh, the, the microphone to Mr. Mohammed to close. Uh, well, thank you so much, Doctor, and uh, Mr. Gokul, for uh, uh, your insights and uh, a good presentation. Uh, as my uh, dear colleague Khulug, uh, Khulud said, we look forward to developing a strategically and mutually beneficial uh, business relationship with, your, uh, with the SAE, and hopefully we're going to see you here again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.